chapter 12 will be the text that we'll be looking at this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. The title of this morning's message is How God Uses Suffering in Our Lives. How God Uses Suffering in the Life of Believers. Subtitled, The Blessings of Buffeting. How God Uses Suffering in Our Lives. And we learn from the example of the Apostle Paul, whom God allowed to suffer greatly, but with a good purpose. With a good purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, specifically we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 10. But to get the context, we'll begin reading God's Word in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 12. The Word of God reads, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body... I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. And though I would desire to glory... I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for the church family that is watching, as well as many others. We pray that you would bless them, that you would minister by your spirit through your word, that there is no purposeless suffering in the life of a believer. Help us to grow in grace. Help us to grow in believers for love for Christ and for one another. Give us a burden for souls to see others come to saving faith in Jesus. Bless, Lord, the teaching of your word. Bless your word by the power of your spirit. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. One pastor put it this way. He said, every believer must learn that human weakness and divine grace go hand in hand together. Now that type of statement, that suffering and God's grace go hand in hand Uh, is a statement that runs contrary to what we hear today. Any kind of weakness today is seen as bad, as unwanted, something to be shunned, something to be pushed away. That is our natural tendency. We don't want any type of weakness or suffering in our life. We want to be physically, emotionally, psychologically strong. True, We want to strive for those things that they're not bad in themselves, but with strength, or at least with assumed strength, come some problems and some dangers when we think and become self-sufficient. The first danger when we think that we're strong, sort of untouchable, and things are going very well in life, the first danger is that of pride. The devil's seemingly chief tool to chop down a believer It deflates our desire to progress in the Christian life because we have the attitude like we have already arrived. We begin to depend on our own wisdom and abilities instead of on the Lord alone. So that is one of the dangers when things are going well and we begin to think highly of ourselves is the danger of pride. But only that, the next danger is that of obsession with our self. 
obsession with ourself. The focus energies and times begin to be focused on building up ourselves, loving ourselves. This happens to the neglect of learning to rest, to depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is the world's philosophy. Listen to one man who said, quote, To fall in love with yourself is the first secret to happiness. Katrina Meyer said, Loving yourself isn't vanity, it is sanity. Ah, what a lie. What philosophy of men. What, what false wisdom of this world. The Lord ever works in our lives that we would grow in love for Him and love for others. It is assumed already that we are too much in love with ourselves. We should learn, and we need to learn more and more to depend on Him and His all-sufficient grace. Sometimes to bring us into the, that place in our life where we're dependent upon God and not self-sufficient, not prideful, God sends the ministry of a thorn in our life. Now that thorn can take different shapes and sizes. It is designed to effectively bring us to a closer knowledge of Christ, a, a humble dependence upon our all-sufficient Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In this world, Jesus said in John 16, In this world ye shall have tribulation. Paul reminded the Christians in Acts 14, 22, We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Even God's most noble servants, like the Apostle Paul, they were not immune to suffering physically and suffering from thorns. I think of the man Jonathan Edwards in the 1700s, America's greatest theologian, a man whom God blessed in the ministry as he ministered there in Northampton, Massachusetts. It was through him that God used him during the great awakening in our country as he preached God's word and saw hundreds, if not thousands, brought to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But just because God used him, just because God's hand of blessing was upon him, and his ministry did not guarantee that he would not suffer in the Christian life. In fact, his heart was broken. It was crushed by the very people he served, his own church there in Massachusetts, over a controversy of where he believed that it should be forbidden for unbelievers to partake of the Lord's Supper, when the church historically had allowed anyone to partake of the Lord's Supper, Edwards took a stronger stance than the church did. As a result of that, the church voted him out. They, they kicked him out as the pastor of the church. The very people he loved and served turned their back on him and stabbed him in the back. Like Jonathan Edwards, the Apostle Paul experienced great pain from those that he loved, the Corinthian church. Paul was rejected by those that he cared for, those that he poured his life into, namely the believers there at the church of Corinth. He suffered spiritually. He had brought the gospel to them. He had nurtured them. He had taught them. He had poured out his life into them so that they would grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul was not only experiencing emotional pain from a church that turned on him, he suffered physically. In fact, in the previous chapter, in chapter 11, he lists some of the sufferings he went through. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23, where he says, Are they, these false teachers, ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more oft, and deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice, three times was I beaten with rods, and once I was stoned, that is stoned to die. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I had been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils, that is dangers of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils among countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils and dangers of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, and in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often and hunger and thirst, fastings often, and cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, 
that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So Paul was no stranger to the emotional pain brought to him by a church being led astray by false teachers or the physical pain of being beaten and sometimes being stoned and left for dead because of the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul empathized with believers who were weak in their faith He burned with a a holy, righteous anger towards the false teachers that were leading believers astray. And in the midst of that, God had important lessons to teach the suffering apostle. And God has important lessons to teach us because we may not be suffering now, but we will see suffering and we do see it all around us. We see it not only people with disease, but people who are anxious, people who are worried about what tomorrow will bring. Suffering is part of living in a broken world. And yet, Paul is a model for us. How he handled suffering in a way that honored the Lord, I pray that we would handle suffering and realize that God has a purpose. There is no purposeless suffering in the life of a genuine believer. What do we learn? God uses suffering in our life to, number one, reveal our true spiritual condition. Suffering reveals your true spiritual condition. Look at verse 5 and 6 with me. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool, for I say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth in me to be or that he heareth of me. Trouble is the truest test of a person's character. When adversity strikes, the so-called superficial mask of, of peace and of happiness is stripped away. It reveals what we really believe in our heart when troubles come. The Lord brought intense suffering into the life of the Apostle Paul. And one of the reasons he did that, did that was to reveal the godly integrity and character and faith that Paul had in Jesus. God used it to establish the credibility of Paul as a true apostle in contrast to the false teachers who were deceiving the Corinthian church. Remember the context. He says, of such a one will I glory. Paul spoke earlier of himself in the third person, earlier in this chapter. He spoke of a man himself, how he had been given visions and revelations, plural, not singular. And he had seen the third heaven, that is, he had gone to the very presence of Almighty God. God had given them many revelations, and yet... He would not boast about it because he didn't earn those blessings of having those visions and revelations. His weakness provided proof that he was a genuine apostle even above his revelations. How else could we explain the impact of his preaching except by the power of God? Paul's boast Paul's boast was not foolish. He was speaking the truth. His visions really did happen. He really did, whether in his body or outside of his body, he really did go to the presence of God and he saw things, wonderful things that God forbade him from explaining or talking to others about. Interesting, Paul didn't go to heaven that all of a sudden uh, write a book to make millions of dollars that way he can contract and make a movie about it. In fact, when he argued about the credentials of an apostle, he said one of the credentials was that I'm weak, I'm I'm, I'm in persecution, and through the preaching of the gospel, people are still saved, and the word of God is still going forth in power. He didn't brag about these revelations. He didn't brag about the visions God had given them. Today, many use alleged mystical experiences to establish their authority. The true measure of a man of God is not his alleged mystical, strange experiences he's had with God. His true measure is his godly life. 
his faithfulness to the word of God. God plunged Paul into the deepest sorrow. In the midst of that, Paul remained faithful to the Lord, who had sovereignly allowed this suffering to come into his life. He remained faithful to him. God had brought this severe pain to him to show that Paul was a genuine man of God. He didn't brag about himself, but he trusted in the Lord who is all sufficient. I was told that many times in the past when a jeweler wanted to demonstrate the difference between a real genuine diamond and a false counterfeit diamond, that they would take the diamonds and put both of them both the true, the genuine one, and the false one in a cup of water. The real diamond would sparkle as it is immersed in water. The false diamond would not sparkle when it is filled or immersed in water. So the believer, the true believer, in the midst of trials and suffering, he does not abandon Christ and his people. He has a genuine faith In the Lord Jesus Christ. Trials and suffering do not make men abandon Christ. They make them cling to Christ. And by the way, it is a contradiction to say, I love Christ, but I despise the body of Christ, which is the local church. In fact, Scripture speaks of those who abandon the local assembly never to be seen. Though they may call themselves Christians, they are not to be recognized as Christians. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Perseverance and following Christ in the fellowship of His church is the hallmark of a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ. The idea that, oh, because I suffered, because people have hurt my feelings, therefore I've abandoned both Christ and the church. Fooey with that. That's wrong. A genuine believer will persevere in faith and following the Lord Jesus Christ. As someone wisely said, Christians, Christians, people who call themselves Christians are are a lot like tea bags. You don't know what's inside of them until you drop them into hot water. Paul, God used suffering in his life to reveal he's a believer, a true believer who clings to Christ by faith, who though the people of God hurt him, he didn't abandon them. He loved them. He persevered in love for God and love for others. That's what suffering did. Paul Paul trusted in the Lord in his grace, not in his visions and experiences. This is what suffering will do. It will reveal our real character. It will reveal our true spiritual condition. But that's not all. Secondly, God uses suffering in our life to make us humble. To make us humble. Look at verse number 7. And least I, Paul, should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Least I should be exalted above measure. Now, the evidence of Paul's success in ministry as he preached the word was the fact that people were genuinely converted and therefore their lives changed. It was the powerful proclamation of the gospel through Paul that led to people being saved and churches being established and grounded in the truth. To see any of those churches being led astray from the truth of the word of God broke Paul's heart. For Paul to suffer physical pain caused him great tribulation in his life. Twice in verse 7, he emphasized that God allowed this thorn in the flesh God allowed it in his life to keep him from exalting himself. Though Paul was certainly a faithful man of God, no doubt, he still was a man. Because of the greatness of the revelations he experienced, 
pride in that was a temptation. No, the Bible's not saying that Paul was proud of his revelations, but that that was a temptation, that was a possible temptation for him. The book of Acts alone records six times when Paul received personal revelations from God. He could have been lifted up because of that. Now, there's many people that brag, hey, I've gone to Paris. I've gone to Switzerland. Paul could have said, so what? I've been to heaven. And he's telling the truth. And yet he didn't brag about it. In fact, when he talked about it, he talked about it in the third person. Almost as to, I have to say it, but I want to draw attention away from myself. I want Christ to be the main star, not me. Paul could have lifted himself in arrogance, but he didn't. He didn't. But because he was a humble man and Christ wanted to keep him humble, God allowed this thorn in his flesh to pierce him, to cause him physical pain. Now, what was that thorn? Well, there's a variety of ideas of what it is because it's not fully clear. Some believe it was the pain of migraines, maybe an eye disease, malaria, an intestinal disorder, or even a speech impediment. I would lean towards the idea that it is an eye disease, though I'm not dogmatic about it. Galatians 6, 11, the Apostle Paul writing to the churches of Galatia says, You see how large a letter I've written unto you with my own hand. Paul often had a co-worker write for him. He would dictate the words to him and he would write for the Apostle Paul. But yet when he writes the Corinthian letter or the Galatian letter to the Galatians, he writes it himself, but he writes it with big letters because he can't see well. In fact, in that letter, Paul says of the churches of Galatia that they loved him so much, they were willing to give him their own eyeballs. Why would you want to give someone their eyeballs if they have perfectly good eyeballs? Well, you wouldn't. But a demonstration out of love, they say, we wish we could give you our eyes because we know how much you suffer with your eyesight. So I think it was his eyes. The thorn in the flesh was, this problem was the messenger of Satan sent to buffet Paul, and yet it was sovereignly allowed by God. The apostle acknowledged that the thorn in the flesh, though somehow satanic forces were involved there, it ultimately was permitted by the hand of God. The hand of God. By the way, Job knew that. Uh, when Job lost his family, in Job chapter 1, with the exception of his wife, when all his kids died, his servants were put to death. Sure, he could blame the people who murdered them. That's true. Uh, when the weather came and, and, and the tornado came and made the house fall on his kids, he, he could have blamed this natural disaster on the devil because the devil was involved in it. And yet, at the end of Job 1, he says, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Though the devil, in a secondary sense, is very much involved in, in Job's suffering and Paul's suffering, yet it is God who is sovereign over all, even the devil himself. And he realized that. God uses even the forces of darkness to accomplish his righteous and holy purposes. God is greater than Satan. And he used the thorn to further the work of the Lord by, watch this, by keeping Paul humble. He was already a humble, dependent man of God, but God was going to keep him humble, and God allowed him to suffer and stay humble. Successful service for Christ depends on being a humble servant of the Lord. The weaker he is, the more the power of Christ accompanied Paul's preaching. I read a story about a Chinese Christian who was made an elder. He was part of the leadership team of his church. When the head pastor was in town, man, he served humbly and faithfully in his church. But when the pastor would leave town on evangelistic work, this new elder became very prideful, very domineering. But then when the pastor would return, he would go back to a position of humility. The man finally confessed his sin that was wrecking his life in the church, and he says it's pride. This is what he said, When I was ordained, Satan whispered in my ear, Now you're somebody important. And I believed him. Pride got a hold of me, and I stopped being a minister, and I started being a menace. For the Christian, you have two choices. For those who have been redeemed by God through faith in Christ. 
as Spurgeon put it, you have two choices. You can either be humble or be humbled, humbled by God. God, in His mercy, humbles Christians to make them dependent more upon the Lord. By the way, as a side note, God also humbles people who are not believers. Uh, people who pretend they're believers, but they're not. God does humble them as well in order to truly save them. God did that with a wicked king of Judah by the name of Manasseh. Manasseh grew in a believer's home. His father was King Hezekiah. He grew, he knew the things of God, but he was a wicked man. Which shows, by the way, you can be raised in a Christian home and still go to hell. You can go to church, you can know hymns, you can read the Bible and be lost. Manasseh, in his story in 2 Kings 21, records how perverse he was. It says that he followed the way of the Canaanites. He rebuilt the shrines that his father destroyed. He built altars to Baal. He put a, a, an idol of Astroth in the very temple of Jehovah God in Jerusalem. He worshipped the host of heaven. He even offered his son in a satanic offering to false gods. He practiced illicit forms of divination and soothsaying, all of these evil things. And then God, in his mercy, brought the king of Assyria to capture him, beat him down, watch this, and to haul him off to prison in Babylon. God took this prideful, arrogant, false believer, grabbed him, and threw him in prison. And it was there in prison. Humbled by God. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 33, 12, And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord Jehovah is God. What happened? God took this prideful, arrogant, false believer who thought he knew it all, living an abominable lifestyle, and God humbled him, not to destroy him, but to save his soul. So God can use suffering to humble a genuine believer. That way he's fully dependent upon the Lord. That's true. God can also humble an unbeliever in grace to bring him savingly to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. God uses suffering in our life. Number three, to bring us closer to Him. Verse eight, to bring us closer to the Lord. Verse eight, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that I might depart from me. Face with this, with these false teachers that were Messing up the church at Corinth that brought sorrow and suffering to him. Faced with this physical illness that brought intense pain to Paul. Paul went to the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort for help. Paul did not seek a quick fix to his problem. He has this problem, this, this suffering, this thorn in the flesh. He didn't go buy a self-help book. He didn't go to the power of positive thinking. No, he, he, he didn't say, oh, I have, a, I have this problem, this, this suffering, and there's demonic powers. That's it. It's time to bind the devil, to bind him, to cast him to the pit. Listen, God will, one day will bind the devil. The book of Revelation is very clear. He'll send an angel to bind him. Until then, it's not your job to tie him up. And if you did tie him up, he's pretty, he has a pretty long leash. Paul, no, he didn't do that. He followed the example of Christ his Lord, who in the Garden of Gethsemane beseeched the Father three times. So Paul now beseeches the Lord in the midst of his pain. Think about it. Paul was close to the Lord. But during times of suffering, God drew Paul even closer to himself. Is it not true that when we go through intense trials in life, we draw closer to God? Is it not true that when suffering happens to ourselves or to our family, we pray more? We're not as, all of a sudden, prayer and the things of God become more important than the entertainment that's on our phones and on our TVs. Many times in our lives, when things are going well, we tend to forget God. 
This was not a new problem. The, the nation of Israel, when, when Moses was bringing them to the border after 40 years of wandering the wilderness, and they're about to enter into the promised land. And remember, Israel had plundered the Egyptians, meaning that every Israelite was pretty rich. They came out with plenty of golden things. And not only are they rich and wealthy, and God has, has saved them from slavery, but they are now entering the promised land, and God says, you're going to inherit houses that you did not build. Uh, you, you, will, uh, you will inherit vineyards that you did not plant. Uh, you're going to be even more wealthy and prosperous and comfortable in the land that I give you. But in the midst of that, he says in Deuteronomy 8, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Be careful. <clears throat> Why? Because wealth and health can make you think you're all that. It can make you think you're not really that dependent upon God. You really don't need to obey that strictly. After all, the most important thing is that you take care of yourself and you're doing good. And other such lies we begin to believe. No. No, no, good God and His mercy brings trials in the lives of believers to draw them near unto the Lord. Think of the word besought. The word besought here, Paul says, I besought the Lord thrice. Three times I besought the Lord. The, the word refers to a begging of God. In fact, it is used in the Gospels of men when they would come and beseech Christ. They would besought the Lord for healing. I think of the leopard in Mark 1. The Bible says that he came unto, unto Jesus, beseeching him, begging Christ, Jesus, thou son of David, heal me. This is the desire. It's, it's an intense calling out to God. This is what Paul was experiencing. God had brought pain and suffering to his life, and now he's responding rightly and praying to God, beseeching the Lord with intensity. God did not answer his prayer the way he wanted, but God did answer his prayer. Paul's thorn was not removed, and yet that doesn't mean that God didn't answer. Paul, no doubt, drew closer to the Lord, and that God is going to answer him by giving him grace in the midst of his trial. Sickness, tragedy, trials have a way of drawing believers closer to the Lord. I think a wonderful example of this is in the life of Fanny Crosby. As a little baby, she was accidentally blinded. And so for all the majority of her 95 years of life, she could not see. <clears throat> and yet, she didn't get bitter at God, angry at God. She grew closer and closer to the Lord as the years went on. In fact, she would end up writing many wonderful hymns like Saved by Grace, Safe in the Arms of Jesus. Instead of rebuking her affliction, or exercising the word of faith over her blindness. She learned to trust the Lord and wrote, Oh, what a happy soul I am. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and to sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. One day... At a Bible conference in Massachusetts, D.L. Moody asked her to get up and to say a word about her testimony of being blind and how she drew closer to the Lord as she grew older and older. This is what she said. There is one hymn, she told Moody, that I have not yet published. I call it my soul's poem. Sometimes when I'm troubled, I repeat it to myself or brings comfort. And then she recited it to the crowd of people and people began to weep. And this is her poem. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. And at age 95, she did see her Savior face to face in glory. Charles Spurgeon spoke of trials and said, I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. You know what I pray? I pray specifically for many things, but one thing I pray is that Emmanuel Baptist Church
as a result of all that we are going through at this time as a church family being unable to gather, I pray that we would learn something during this time. I pray that when we gather again as a church body, and Lord willing it will be soon, that we will cherish that times more and stop using weak excuses to stay home. If we cannot treat the church congregating as important as your job, I wonder how many times you skip work because you feel like loving yourself at home. That we will treasure that time when we can gather as a church to worship together as God intends. I pray when all this is over and we can gather again, that we will treasure and love the church as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. God uses suffering in our life to bring us closer to him. And number four, God uses suffering in our life to show the power of His grace. To show the power of His grace. Look at the first phrase here in verse 9. And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. By the way, just as a side note here, Paul is crying out to God, and then later on we find out he's speaking of Christ. This is one of the many passages that speaks of a person, a believer, praying to Christ because he is God. He says here, unto me, Paul says, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul's three requests for relief are answered from the Lord. But God did not answer by removing the thorn in the flesh from Paul. The pain God allowed in Paul's life was spiritually productive. It revealed Paul's character. It humbled him. It drew Paul near to the Lord. The Lord granted Paul relief, not by removing his suffering, but by giving him his all-sufficient grace to endure it in a way that honors God. Grace is often defined as uh, God's undeserved favor. True. His grace is, God's grace is His favor poured out on those who not only deserve it, but they deserve the opposite. They deserve punishment from Him, and yet He pours out His goodness on them. God's grace is never obligated. That is, God owes nobody grace. That's why He said to Moses, repeated by Paul, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. He owes no one grace or mercy. And yet He gives it. He gives it freely to sinners. God is regularly gracious to His people. He's called in 1 Peter 5.10, the God of all grace. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We are justified freely by His grace, Romans 3.24. We are called in 2 Peter 3.18 to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's grace, watch this now, very important. God's grace is not sufficient only to get you to heaven, but not to live on earth. God's grace is sufficient, yes, to take you to glory, but also it is sufficient to keep you living a life that honors God here on this earth. God's grace is sufficient not only for the the, 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 the heaven, but also living faithfully on earth. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. How sad that the average Christian denies the sufficiency of God's grace in dealing with life's problems. In place of God's all-sufficient grace, His sufficient Word and the work of the Holy Spirit, in place of God's all-sufficient grace, they supplement it with the humanistic theories of psychology. Many view divine grace sufficient. Oh, God's grace is sufficient for those small problems. But for those deep problems, inner problems, deep, deep, those are just too deep for the Bible, just too deep. Who made you? God did. Who knows you better than any psychiatrist prescribing you drugs? God. He knows you better than anybody. And he says his grace is sufficient to live a God-honoring life now. If God's word does not have the answers to all of life's problems, how can it be called perfect? And yet it is. Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect. 
Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Paul said very clearly in 2 Timothy 3.16, For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, fully mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, fully equipped, not halfway equipped, not three-fourths equipped until the brilliant leaders of psychology help us with that other miss, missing one-fourth. No, God's word is sufficient. He hath, his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The problem is we just don't want to hear what God says about our problems. The truth is many times we just want to shop around for counsel. See who can stroke us best instead of for the truth that can truly, truly help us best. God declared to Paul in his answer to prayer, and he said, My grace is sufficient for thee. The Lord affirmed the total sufficiency for his, of his grace for all of life's problems. Our need. What is our need? Our need is to believe the gospel. Our need is to understand the word of God and apply it to every area of life. It's not a buffet for you to pick and choose. By his grace... And only by His grace can we overcome dominating and slaving sin. By His grace alone can we endure suffering like the Apostle Paul and glorify God. Remember what the Lord promised in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. For there is no temptation, no trial that has taken you but such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not permit you to be attempted above that which you are able. But with the temptation... He will also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Number one, there is no temptation that only, only you alone have gone through this. No, that's not true. All the trials of life, many people have gone through them. But secondly, he will not allow you to be, be in a trial in which it, it overtakes you if you rely on him. He will get you through the trial that he has allowed for you by his grace. He will. Spurgeon told the story as he was riding home, going through many trials, he went through many trials in his life. His own brother turned against him as he stood for the word of God and others began to compromise the gospel. Many of his own fellow ministers turned on him, writing evil things about him. He was heartbroken. He also suffered from physical disease. His wife was invalid most of her life. He went through many heavy trials and one day he was so depressed that he was writing going home. As he was writing, on his way home, and he remembered God brought this verse to mind and said, My grace is sufficient for thee. In his mind, he immediately pictured a small little fish in the Thames River, the large river there in London. And he thought of a little, little fish swimming through it, the river, and, and then all of a sudden the fish gets worried. Am I going to drink too much water and take away all the water from the river? Oh, silly little fish. Drink up, says the Thames River. Drink up. There's plenty of water for you, little fish. My water is all sufficient for you. And then Spurgeon says, I pictured a little mouse. Oh, a little tiny mouse. And he was there. The little mouse was in this large granary, one of the many granaries that Joseph helped build, full of grain for all of Egypt and the Eastern world. And the little mouse nibbled on a grain and says, oh, I better not eat too much because I might eat and there will be no more grain in the granaries. And Joseph looks at the little mouse and says, oh, little mouse, cheer up. My granaries are sufficient for thee. And then he pictured a man climbing a mountain and he gets on top of this mountain and he's bringing, breathing that fresh air. There's nothing like the air of Kern County, y'all, I'm telling you. No, this is better air. He's on top of the mountain and he's breathing this fresh air. And then as he's breathing the air, as he's alone, is on top of this beautiful, majestic mountain. The climber says, man, I better be careful. That I don't breathe too much air because I might suck all the air out of the earth. No, the creator booms his voice out of heaven and says, breathe away, old man. Breathe away and fill your lungs with air. My atmosphere is sufficient for thee. Ah, God's grace is sufficient for you. 
It is sufficient for every believer in every circumstance that God has sovereignly allowed in your life. God uses suffering in our life, number five and lastly, to cause us to grow. To cause us to grow. Verse 9, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, human weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul says, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Notice, God wanted to display His grace in Paul's life, but He also wanted to display His power through Paul. He wanted him humble, true, but He also wanted him to be spiritually strong. God's strength is made perfect in Paul's physical weakness. Therefore, it was necessary that the, the, fly, the, the fires of affliction, the fires of suffering would, would purge away the dross of pride, that would purge away the dross of self-confidence. Paul had lost all human ability to deal with the problem at Corinth. Paul had lost all ability. No medicine would help him with his sickness. He was at the point where all he could do is trust the Lord and wait for God's power to move on his behalf. Yes, that's where God wanted him. God was, in effect, saying to Paul, I will not remove the thorn from you, but I'm going to do something for you, Paul, better. I will give you grace to bear it. Grace to bear it. And just remember, Paul, that although I have not given you what you asked for, yet I am giving you what you need most deeply. You want my power and strength to accompany your preaching, don't you? Well, the best way to have that happen is to keep you in a place of weakness, a place where you're fully dependent upon God. We are most effective when we realize how weak and ineffective we are independent of God. Then, then we have nowhere else to turn but the Lord. Someone said, no one in the kingdom of God is too weak to experience God's power. But many are too confident in their own strength. Paul did not love the pain that was caused by his illness and false teachers wrecking the church. Yet, he embraced it as a means by which God <clears throat> would release his power in and through his life. He rested in that. He rested in that. God's grace strengthened Paul to face adversities, insults, hardships. God's grace will do the same for you. Philip Brooks, a preacher of generations past, said it best. He says, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be better men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Ask for powers equal to your tasks. I reminded the story of a preacher, Dr. John Stott. He was preaching back in 1958. It was a university outreach in Sydney, Australia. He was to give the last message out of, Mark, out of Matthew 7 about the narrow gate, an evangelistic sermon to thousands of college students who were gathered there that day. That e the evening before the day he would preach, the day before, he received the bad news that his father had died. In the midst of that, he could not see how he could go on. Not only that, he began to lose his voice because of illness. What was he to do? Well, this is what he did. He gathered with the young people who had gathered this, who, who had put up, who, who ended up forming this evangelistic meeting. He gathered with the leaders and said, this is a situation. My dad just died. I'm sick. I can barely speak. Pray for me. I am the weakest I've ever been in my life. He gathered, they, they laid hands on him. They began to pray and to beseech God. Oh, God, help him. Help him to preach the word. He said he got up. Not with great eloquence, but with a raspy voice. And he mumbled the word of God. He taught the Bible that day. He says it's one of the, probably one of the worst sermons he preached. And yet God in great power blessed that message like no other message he ever preached. 
Hundreds were converted by the grace of God through the preaching of that weak vessel of that sickly, broken man, Dr. John Stott. Why? Well, God uses weak things. He uses weak people who are humble. God uses suffering. God uses suffering in our life, how? To show the reality of our faith. Are we real? God uses suffering in our life to keep us humble, to keep us dependent upon Him, not ourselves. God uses suffering to bring us to a closer relationship to Him. God uses suffering to show His power in our lives, that it is of His grace, not of our goodness. God uses suffering in our life to cause us to grow, to cause us to trust in the Lord, to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as I end, let me ask you, God does use suffering also in the life of those who are not truly saved, those who are not converted. As you see suffering and disease, every day you see that when you turn on the TV of how many people have died because of the coronavirus, how many people are worried because of the pandemic. As you see death all around you, let me ask you, are you ready to meet your maker? Where will you spend eternity when you die? Do not delay any longer. Come to Christ. 2 Corinthians 6 tells us, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When the Gospels preach, it always demands an immediate response. It's never, this is the truth of Christ, go home and think about it. Oh no. This is the truth that Christ lived a perfect and sinless life. He went to the cross to die for sinners in their place. He was buried. On the third day, He rose again from the dead. He grants everlasting life to any and all who repent of their sin and place their faith in Him. And the command of the gospel is, repent ye and believe the gospel. Immediately, right now, turn from your sin and turn to Christ. The issue is, well, if I, if I had the coronavirus and I was in the ICU, then, Pastor Castro, then, then I'll get right. No, wrong. You're to respond to the gospel when you hear it. Do not harden your heart. Respond. Come to Christ. Come to Jesus as he's offered freely in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Don't trust in self. Don't trust in the government. No doctor can save you from the wrath to come. Turn to Christ. He is the the good physician. He is the good shepherd. He will save you if you come to Him in faith. He is a willing Savior. Will you bow the knee in repentance and believe in Him? Oh, I pray that you will. That you will turn to Christ immediately. And by faith, trust Him and Him alone for your eternal salvation. Pray that God would bless His word by the power of His Holy Spirit to your life and mind. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your word. Thankful for the reality that even in the midst of suffering, you use it for your glory, for your holy purposes in our life. I pray for those who are suffering physical illness. Many are even in the hospital. Many suffering from different illnesses, including the coronavirus, have mercy on their bodies, have mercy upon their souls. Father, I pray for those that are in the medical field helping, loving their neighbors as they serve others who are sick in the hospital. Pray for our medical workers, for their protection, that you would guide them and help them. Father, I pray for those who have listened to your word this day, that they would respond in greater trust, realizing that you sovereignly sovereignly use sickness in order to grow us in our faith to make us more dependent, to make us more Christ-like, that we would grow as believers during this time, during this time of pandemic. Father, I pray for those that are not saved, those who have heard the good news of the gospel, that they would not delay any longer, but that today would be the day of salvation, that today they would repent of their sin and turn by faith unto Jesus Christ and be saved. Bless your word, For your glory, we ask in Christ's name, amen.